Good evening, everyone. It's lovely to see so many people here today, midweek in Geelong, and everyone's out. How fantastic. How many um, people, is this your first outing in six months? Yep, maybe more. Maybe in uh, 2021, who knows? So, good evening and welcome, everyone. My name is Vanessa Schoenekau, and I'm the CEO of the Geelong Regional Library Corporation. And I'm pleased to welcome you all to Wadi Yuang and the Geelong Library and Heritage Centre tonight for this special women's health event. The Geelong Regional Library Corporation acknowledges Wadarong and Eastern Ma original owners of the lands on which our library services operate. And we pay respect to Wadawurrung and Eastern Ma elders past, present and emerging and any um, First Nations people who are in the room here tonight. We acknowledge and celebrate First Nations peoples of this land as the custodians of learning, literacy, knowledge and story. And uh, it is indeed wonderful for us to be able to gather here together. And I'd uh, like to thank you for your patience. If it did take you a little while coming up in the lifts tonight, um, but thank you. And uh, just one of those challenges with COVID if people were social distancing. One of the key pillars of our library plan, Connecting and Thriving, is community. And one of our key objectives as a library corporation is to provide a special focus on our community's health and well-being. And so that's why I'm so pleased to be introducing our important discussion tonight. And do you know the, the Geelong Regional Library Corporation has, we have nearly 130,000 members and approximately 62% of them identify as women. And similarly, be no surprises for all of you who are here tonight, 82% um, of our author event attendees identify as women and approximately 83% are aged 50 or older. So it is lovely to have some younger um, people in the audience joining us. Um, but women's ageing is certainly a topic that is obviously close to many of our hearts, including mine. Um, so tonight's book, Secret of Women's Healthy Ageing, draws on the findings of a unique cultural study that's focused on the health of more than 400 women in their mid to late lives. Over the past 30 years, a team of international investigators has compiled a remarkable amount of data aiming to raise awareness of modifiable risk factors in women's health. And um, I'm looking forward to, to learning more tonight. So um, please let me introduce our special guest facilitator for this evening's discussion. Dr. Geraldine Masson, our facilitator, is the Director of Women's Services at Barwon Health's University Hospital of Geelong and only been in the role since last August, as we were discussing um, just earlier, when, when you moved to Geelong from the UK during COVID. So we're very glad to have you here tonight. And um, I know that, Geraldine, you've been an obstetrician for the past 30 years and a strong advocate for women's health. So. Before I hand over, I uh, just want to let you know that there will be an opportunity for questions following tonight's discussion. So please have a think about what you might like to ask later. And for now, please join me in welcoming Geraldine, who will in turn introduce tonight's author, Professor Cassandra Zerke. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Vanessa, and good evening, everyone. I'm so pleased to be here this evening on behalf of Bowen Health and to be talking on this subject. And isn't this a fabulous room? This is my first opportunity to get up here. Tonight's author, Cassandra Zerke, is a professor of medicine, a doctor, a scientist, and a clinical researcher, and an expert in women's health. And she's got so many qualifications that when she goes to the Northern Hemisphere, they call her Professor Dr. Dr. Cassandra Zerke. <laughs> she is the director of Women's Healthy Aging Project at the University of Melbourne and has published hundreds of academic and clinical publications. Cassandra's book, Secrets of Women's Healthy Aging, 
if you haven't seen it before, um, draws on the findings of a unique study covering the brain, heart, gut health, diet, sleep, exercise, and the benefits of socializing. Importantly, these highlight, findings highlight how the results relate directly to women's well-being. In Secrets of Women's Healthy Aging, Cassandra shares the wisdom revealed by this comprehensive study showing how to promote overall wellness and providing key ingredients for living a long and healthy life. So welcome, Cassandra, and please tell us what exactly are those key ingredients. Thank you so much, Geraldine. Trapped. Like Okie doke. So, Cassandra, you've, you're, um, you've got a lot of qualifications and you've done an awful lot in your short life, because <laughs> we're not aging yet. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about you, um, the woman behind the, the project and the group? How, how did you get oh. to this point in your life? Wow, that's a question no one's ever asked me. I'm not prepared for that one. Um, you know, serendipity, yeah. Actually, I w when I started in med school, I was trying just so much to be like a boy. I actually said to uh, a US neurologist, I said to him, just treat me like a man. And he looked at me like I was totally crazy. And now that we're in this world, I'm like, now I see what he was looking at. <laughs> yes. Um, so I actually did my PhD in this cohort and I actually looked at osteoarthritis. I didn't mean to, I'm a neurologist. I went into this cohort and they were finishing their menopause at the time I, I did my PhD and I wanted to look at the most common symptom that women were experiencing and I was very interested in their cognition. And when I, we did the surveys, everyone was talking hot flushes. They absolutely had hot flushes or if you're American, hot flashes, um, <laughs> absolutely had them. But the, the most common symptom was aches and joint pains. And I just got totally swept away. Forget I'm a neurologist. <laughs> what are these aches and joint pains? Everyone's talking about hot flushes. What are these aches and joint pains? So we actually did x-rays of hands and knees. Sure enough, people actually had osteoarthritis. I mean, this wasn't just aches and joint pains. <laughs> this was real. Mm -hmm. So I actually ended up doing a PhD in osteoarthritis, got offered a position as a rheumatologist <laughs> because I'd done a PhD in osteoarthritis. But I, I really always wanted to be a neurologist and um, cognition's my passion. And so I did a postdoc at Stanford on cognition because actually in Australia, cognition's predominantly done by geriatricians or psychiatrists who specialise in psychogeriatrics. Um, so I went to America where only neurologists um, do cognition and then came back here and got all the most interesting cases in hospitals because anything that was a little curly, they gave to the neurologist. So it was really great. Um, and then I really looked at this cohort because the money had run out in the early noughties at the turn of the century. How old am I, Geraldine? <laughs> I have to say the turn of the century, my God. The money had run out because this was a study that was initially looking at the menopause. Lots of companies are interested in the menopause because maybe they could give you something you have to pay for. <laughs> to do. So that's when the funding ran out. And you also have to understand, like, 200 years ago, the mean age of death for women was 50. The mean age of menopause is 50. So no one cared too much about the postmenopause because not many people were getting there. But the postmenopause is probably the most important. Thank goodness um, we actually got funding at the turn of the century to continue the study into the postmenopause. And then a decade later, we continued onward and onward and onward. And now internationally, it's made my career, these wonderful women who've stuck with us, um, because nowhere else in the world is there 30 years of data. Every study of the menopause stopped at the menopause. Today, a woman spends one third of her life in the postmenopause, and we know nothing. Mm. So, for the benefit of the people in the audience who haven't had a chance to read your book, do you want to um, explain how the study started um, and how you recruited your volunteers. So the study started back in 1990. I mean, it probably started in the late 80s. A psychiatrist started the study and she did that because she was getting all these referrals because her husband was an obstetrician gynaecologist <laughs> and she was getting all these referrals for these <clears throat> crazy women 
who were going through this transition. And she was very interested in hysteria. She wrote a lot of papers on hysteria and she wanted to examine this transition, look at hormones, look at blood tests. She brought together this amazing group of people. Henry Berger, who actually got an order of Australia for his work in this study, he's an endocrinologist and he defined those endocrinological transitions. It's real, it's to do with mm -hmm. hormones. <laughs> Um, and this multidisciplinary team looked at every single aspect across that transition. And that's how it started. It was funded in 1990. The first women came, um, there was a telephone interview first, back when everyone had a telephone like a home. May I speak to the lady of the house? Um, and that's how it started. Um, and over 2,000 women took part in that first telephone survey. And then those people who were still menstruating went into the study. When I took over at the turn of the century, we went back. And those people who weren't invited at the beginning because they weren't menstruating or were on hormone therapy or had, had a hysterectomy, we invited them back in. And we've just been asking them everything about their lives. You ask me, I bet we've asked it. These poor, wonderful human beings, some of whom live in your region and more now than at the beginning. <laughs> a lot of them lived in Melbourne initially, but they've all moved here. Um, they spend four to five hours with us. We put them through cognitive testing. One of the unique things about this study, um, you know, we've got some great work in Australia as well as internationally doing telephone surveys. So thousands of people that have been looked at for years, but only on the telephone. Every one of our participants has blood tests. Some of them have had up to three bone scans with us. Um, several brain imaging studies. So that kind of physical measurement partnered with questions is what's really important when you're trying to understand disease. And some of our most pivotal papers have actually looked at amyloid load in the brain because we measured that in these women as well. Do you think that the women that you've studied, because they were being watched and tested, have behaved differently as they've grown older? So, it's absolutely true that any study where people stay in the study, they're clearly not dead. <laughs> <laughs> and anyone who died stopped coming. So, absolutely, the people who are still coming, they are healthier because they didn't... So, some people have passed away um, and obviously they're no longer in the study. So, it's absolutely true. That's true of every study around the world. Um, what we tend to do now, because you'll never get a study where you're looking at people for 30 years that don't have that bias of the people who drop out, sometimes drop out because they're unwell. We have started comparing the results of our women with the Australian Bureau stats on women of the same age. And so far, women are now 75 to 85, they are on par, not statistically significantly different from the Australian Bureau of Statistics women of the same age. So they're actually quite average. They're very special women. But, <laughs> but statistically, <laughs> they're quite average women, very representative of women in Australia, which has been remarkable. But I have a confession. Go on. Oh, this is also true of anyone who's in a study. People who are in research studies, they tend to do better because people are asking questions and finding things. We did vitamin D testing. It was my brilliant idea. We did it back in the turn of the century. How old am I, Geraldine? This is really <laughs> embarrassing. We did vitamin D levels. It was at a time, no one was doing vitamin D. What is vitamin B? But I went to a conference, heard about it. Right, we're doing it. And almost 80% of our women were deficient in vitamin D. Well, of course, anything we find, we send to the GPs with a letter explaining what this is. And they came back uh, two years later and everyone was on supplements and their vitamin D levels were perfect. And I was like, damn it, you know, so I've ruined my own observational study because clearly, so confessing, yes, there's absolutely, I think, some elements that uh, they'd be much healthier than average people. It's really interesting, isn't it? Because in I, I'm an obstetrician and in um, our maternity care, we've stopped testing vitamin I D levels. I heard that. Because everybody's vitamin D is low. And I think that's because, as Australians, you're so phenomenally good at putting sun cream on. And in your book, you talk about mm. your vitamin D levels yes, when well, you're pregnant. Yes, well, I had an obstetrician. They're marvellous people. <laughs> And my obstetrician said to me, Cassandra, the only person who has a vitamin D level as low as yours 
it, mine was actually undetectable, it was under the, the cutoff, is this woman who'd come straight from, she was Muslim, so she's fully covered. And in her country, they have open courtyard areas mm -hmm. where they get sun. And she was in a, a housed accommodation by the government and just could not uncover. And she had the same levels as me. He said, what, what, what are you doing? And I realised I was getting to work before the sun rose. And I was leaving work after the sun set every day, summer and winter. And I went, oh. So then what I used to do is I, I would literally... Um, uh, I was in neurology training at the time I had my first child. And um, in my final year... And I was always in the emergency department. So every time emergency department called me down, I'd go, I'd assess the patient, and before I went up to the ward, I'd walk out those main big doors where all the ambos are coming in, and I'd stand there like this. <laughs> Five minutes, two forearms, which was my ten minutes, one forearm, yeah, like this. <laughs> and people must have come to the ED going, whoa, another psych patient there, you know, I hope they left. <laughs> but that's what I did, and I got my vitamin D levels back up. So I'm surprised you guys aren't testing. Is, is your hope that it won't? We don't test because everybody's is low. So we don't everybody you need on to vitamin D. Oh, you just supplement just everyone supplement. in the bread now. Yeah. Interesting. So one of the uh, with my book, I did absolutely write about all of the women in this study. But to be honest, everything up here, I put on the page. I know a lot of you are like, that's not a very thick book. Is that all that's in your head? <laughs> It was twice as long, but they said <laughs> it can only be 50,000 words. People can't cope. Okay. There's a second book just waiting on the shelf of the stuff <laughs> they pulled out of it. Um, but I actually used everything I know. So when you're in this field, you're working internationally with other people, you're going to conferences. So actually everything I picked up from everywhere is in the book, and you'll see that because I refer to the international work. The thing is, with international work, and we didn't do this work, with vitamin D, when they gave supplementation, and they did the Cochrane reviews looking at supplementation, mm. vitamin D is associated with diabetes, associated with musc um, multiple sclerosis, associated with dementia, associated with lots of things, um, including bone health and bone disease. If you take supplementation, it fixes the bone disease. But none of the other Cochrane reviews actually showed that supplementation fixes the other diseases. So there's some really interesting biochemical work when we get vitamin D, we don't eat it. We predominantly get it from the sun. It actually is created in our skin. There's a chemical reaction that gives us the active vitamin D that we use. And the theory is that this sun chemical reaction has an anti-inflammatory component to it. So it could be that the vitamin D is not the vitamin D. It's that process of that chemical reaction that we need to settle our immune system. So I found that fascinating. I put that in the book. Just a fascination of mine. But that's interesting because I don't know if supplementation, that's why in the book I do recommend sun, um, but sun smart sun. There was even a paper written last year about vitamin D and people with COVID. And mm. if you had high vitamin D levels, you were more likely to um, throw off the COVID infection if you got it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so you're a neurologist by trade and fascinated by the brain. What yes. makes our organ so special? Oh, my God. <gasps> so I go to women's conferences a lot, obviously, because I'm the director of the Women's Healthy Ageing Project. And when I get up and I put up a picture of the brain, half the audience is sitting there going, I'm in the wrong room. <laughs> like, what's she talking about? Because there's not bits and bobs up there, you know. To me, a woman is defined by her brain, is she not? My God. The brain for every human is everything. The brain is everything. Anything you want to talk about, lungs, yep, brain controls that. Legs, totally controlled by the brain. All of your organs are actually controlled by the brain. It's a central control command centre. Cardiologists always love to harass me because there's a little electrical current in your heart that lets it beat on, it, on its own. You can actually put it outside the body. It's still beating, so they think they're very clever. That's not a brain. The brain really is everything we consider to be us as human beings. Also, the brain's been neglected. So, you know, when we were in training, um, maybe you're not Last as old as me. This yeah. was. <laughs> before, before the turn of the century, good Lord, um, there were no really good MRI scans. I know everyone now goes and gets an MRI. But honestly, when medicine started, there were X-rays. In Egyptian times, they were taking out the heart and they were working out how it worked. But we have not been able to see into the brain because anytime someone opened the brain up, yeah, it just stopped working, yeah? 
whereas hearts, as I said, can beat outside the human body. We could understand them very easily. X-rays, all you could see was a skull because we were well designed to protect the most important organ we have. So then came CT scans and they were very fuzzy. And then at the turn of the century, we really started using MRI. And it's only in the last 10 years we've had those specialised traces that bind to some of the things like amyloid in our brain. And to this day, we can't really see the brain. When I was at Stanford, um, Bill Gates actually came and gave a lecture um, on neurology, which is why I went. I'm not a fan of Bill Gates otherwise. But I tell you, I was surrounded by computer engineering people. Why are you in a neurology talk? Anyway, and he was there describing a three-dimensional scan he was working on of the brain. It was brilliant. I don't know if you guys know about electron microscopy, but with electron microscopy, you can actually see the neurotransmitters actually moving. You can see the actual relationship between the movements and the thoughts in the brain. And I was like, oh, my God, this is unbelievable. I've been waiting since that day. He, at the time, said this is a one-by-one-centimetre cube of a rat brain because the computer power we have can only cope with that much data for one second. That's all they had. But since that day, I've been going, come on, computer engineers around me. <laughs> haven't you worked out more... Com they haven't. It's unbelievable. We've somehow plateaued in the memory or computer capacity, so they haven't been... Up I'm waiting for that day. That would be us starting to understand the brain. At the moment, the best function of the brain we've got is either where you're metabolising sugar, that's the FDG PET scans, and it just kind of shows like a heat map. Oh, there's a bit more going on there, <laughs> a bit less going on there. It's not nearly what we need to understand. So it's the final frontier of medicine. That's why I became a neurologist. Okay. I'm a Wild West girl. <laughs> you talked before about your expertise in cognition. Why do you think that's so important while we age, as we age? Well, I'll tell you the reason I started doing it. I was not in cognition. I was doing what every good doctor should do. I did general medicine, loved it. Was a total renegade for doing a PhD in rheumatology when I was becoming a neurologist. Very naughty of me, but I love it. Right? I love general medicine. But you have to specialise. I became a neurologist. I then did a three-year epilepsy fellowship. That's not quite specific enough. So then I did my postdoc in cognition, actually because my patients, because I was a young neurologist, I was seeing all these patients who were young. I got all the new patients. And they were all, because I was at the Royal Melbourne Hospital, a lot of my patients were studying. And they'd all have seizure. They're taking these drugs to stop the seizure. And you understand, if you have a seizure, you can't drive, you can't, can't do anything, right? So as a doctor, you say, stay on the medication. But these side effects, stay on the medication because you don't want to have a seizure. And my lawyers and, and students were saying, I can't explain to you, I can't think the way I used to think. And I was fascinated by this because it wasn't on the side effect checklist. Um, and so I actually published a number of papers on cognition in epilepsy and looked at those cognitive side effects. And then, because I did a genetics degree somewhere in there, I was very interested that certain people had different risks. And it turns out different genes can give you different responses to anticonvulsant drugs. And so that's how I got in cognition. And I did that postdoc cognitive fellowship. But when I came back to Australia, I was one of five neurologists in the country that did cognition. So I kind of got sucked into general cognition and dementia. And then one day I'm in clinic, I'm sitting there, I'm realising, you know, two thirds of all people with dementia are women. Has it not, no one ever taught me that, they never talked about that, it's not a thing. Is this real? Maybe it's just here. No, internationally, globally, two thirds of all cases of dementia are women, and yet we don't talk about that. Leading cause of death in this country for women, what are, what are most of us gonna die of? It's dementia. And it's just not something talked about, not something discussed, and ah, then I became a feminist. Never wanted to be. Okay, so that's, shall we talk about menopause? Sure. Okay. So in the past, people talked about how terrible the menopause was for women, um, about women being hysterical and the concept of the empty nest syndrome. What do you think about those concepts? So, um, yeah, okay. So I wish, I wish I could say to you, oh my God, you know, in the past, people thought women were hysterical when they presented to emergency department with chest pain. 
And they said, well, it's not exactly crushing and it doesn't go down my left arm, but I've got this, like, pressure. I feel pressure and I'm really tired. And they got sent home. And the man in the cubicle next to them, who had exactly the same symptoms, same age, same risk, got taken upstairs for a cath. <laughs> this is data from the last five years. Yeah? But you're no longer allowed to diagnose hysteria. Interesting story. So in the DSM-4, there's a hysteria diagnosis. It was, you know, 90% female, of course, got that diagnosis. They worked out it was a... Can I swear? I can't swear. No. <laughs> It was an insert blank diagnosis, not a diagnosis. It was not real. Um, and so they actually removed it from the DSM-4. They said, well, this is not a... Hysteria doesn't exist. It's no thing. It's not... It's clearly a diagnosis of I don't know. And it turned out a lot of the hysterical women had real disease. So they removed it from the DSM-4. No one's allowed to diagnose anyone with hysteria anymore. So they just diagnose you with, it's not a heart attack, go home, and women have their heart attacks at home. And this has now been documented. So be careful. You know what's wrong, and no one will call you hysterical, although some still do, I tell you what. But if you feel like someone's saying you're hysterical, the best advice is to just trust yourself. And I know that's impossibly hard because you're always undermined. Um, but we have to trust ourselves, and hopefully our daughters will not have that sort of attitude to them in ED because it's really all coming out now. In the last five years, it's been a really big um, issue. And what about emptiness syndrome? Oh, so um, this was uh, the, the lady who started the study, this was her bugbear, the emptiness syndrome, that all these women had to go to a psychiatrist because they're going a bit funny around the menopause and it must be the empty nest syndrome. So she actually made her career on the publications which she did showing empty nest syndrome Women were healthier, happier, having more sex, um, doing great things with their lives with the empty nest. My, my kids are here, so no, no offence. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> um, but it was the best thing that happened to women when their children left home. And then when the children came back home, there were some very good positives and so on, but the sex went down and th things went, went down. So there was no women feeling like they had nothing to do. That did not actually exist. And this study actually turned that around with what it found. Just have to ask women instead of telling them what they. Hormone replacement therapy. Now, mm. the, um, controversial. In my career um, as obstetrician gynaecologist, um, the advice has changed up and down, <laughs> and whether you know, and it is controversial. So, why do, you, why can you explain to the audience why the advice keeps changing for women mm. about what we should have or what we shouldn't have and. Mm. Wow. Oh, I need my slide deck and a one-hour <laughs> lecture for this. So, let's start with Big Pharma. No. Okay. Um, so, the big study that you will have all heard of is the Women's Health Initiative study. And that said, my God, stop taking it. It's going to kill you. What happened before that was every single research paper, every rat study, every paper showed oestrogen was protecting women. Men were dying. Women were not. Because remember, mean age of death was 50, and women were really healthy because oestrogen was protecting them. Then we saw that after 50, women got the same disease as men were getting. They got heart disease, they got strokes. I told you dementia was the leading cause of death in women, second is heart disease, third is stroke. So after menopause, women were getting men's diseases, only they were getting them worse. So. Um, more rapid decline and worse disease. But some of that could be being sent home from emergency department, so. Um, and so oestrogen looked protective. What the Women's Health Initiative did was say, even though we've had some studies here and there giving hormone therapy, showing benefit, some others have not shown benefit, we're gonna do the best study in the world. We're gonna get billions of dollars, we're gonna get 50,000 women, we're gonna randomize them, which means, oh, look at this room. Half the room's going to get the tablet, half the room's not going to get the tablet, and you guys aren't going to know which tablet you got, and I'm not going to know which tablet I gave you. Now, that's a really cool experimental study from the scientist's point of view. A couple of problems. To do that, if any of you have symptoms, you have to leave the room, because I can't randomise you if you've actually got symptoms. 
So anyone who had bad symptoms, hot flushes, for example, was not allowed in the study. Number two, I can't give you hormone therapy if you were just on it yesterday or if you could have been on it, so on. So the mean age of the women in the study was 63. The mean age of menopause is 50. So we're talking 12 years after the hormones have left the system. Estradiol is undetectable by old assays after menopause. You're reintroducing estrogen. That does not work. WHI proved that. If you're over a decade after menopause, don't start taking the kind of menopause um, treatment they had, which was conjugated equine estrogen. Pregnant mares, so many different estrogens, I can't remember them all, I bet you know them all. There's like 15 different estrogens in that pregnant mare preparation, and it does cause more clots. The new estrogens are estradiols, their synthesized estrogen looks very much like human estrogen, doesn't have the same risk profile, but introducing it over 63, not a good idea. What they found was it didn't make hearts better, and they found that there were clots, which there are even with the oral contraceptive pill, we know that, um, and there were many less fractures. Oh my goodness, even though these women were 63, hormone therapy, really good for bones. It's so good for bones. The question that remained that nobody asked <laughs> was what if it was the women with symptoms that probably needed the therapy more? We now know, and they didn't know it at the time, it's not their fault, they didn't know it. Women with hot flushes, they're not just random weird events that women complain about. Women with hot flushes are more likely to have heart disease. It's an indicator and a risk for getting heart disease. Second leading cause of death, heart disease in women. So maybe it was those women who would benefit most from maintaining estrogen, and yet they were excluded from the study. Number two, you might need to be taking estrogen at the time of menopause, rather than once it's washed out of the system, reintroducing it. If there's one thing we know about the human body, if you change the homeostasis, the body has a new homeostasis. You don't want to muck that up. So that's the questions. And of course, so much money was spent on the Women's Health Initiative, and it ended in 2002, and um, I believe hormone therapy prescription in Europe and US dropped by 80%. So 80% of women just overnight stopped taking it. So we actually don't have the data then on the women who were taking it from <laughs> to be able to say, oh, what happened to them? Well, 80% of them stopped in 2002. Terrified. Interestingly, in 2005, they started retaking it because they couldn't cope. <laughs> um, so that's interesting. But again, there were a select group of people who went back on it. So we don't know. In the New England Journal of Medicine, published just a couple of years ago, they actually gave hormone therapy, the new stuff, the estradiol stuff, to women who had just finished their menstrual periods. And because these women are 50-ish, they're not going to get heart disease or dementia. So all they could do was image their vessels here, the big carotid vessels that go to the brain. And if you have narrowing in those vessels, you are more likely to get stroke or heart disease. It doesn't mean you will get it. And they showed that the women who took hormone therapy for five years had less narrowing in their vessels. And so that's kind of really, now that goes to medical advice because it was a randomised control trial. Goes to advice. However, people are saying, well, hang on, hang on. What's the risk of breast cancer? You don't know because they're only 50. And how do you know that the narrowing is going to relate to heart disease or stroke? Maybe it's just narrowing. And so that's why it's so confusing. It's confusing for us, let alone <laughs> for everyone else. We really need more research on it, but please understand, drug companies invest billions in developing a drug, and they charge a lot. I mean, I think they charge too much, but I'm not in pharma. They think they charge the right amount to recoup what they invest. These drugs are now off patent. So who would be funding mm -hmm. to do new research? Mm -hmm. Women's groups. <laughs> One of the great things that I read in the book is about being active. And actually, you don't need to be that active for it to make a difference. And when we were sat downstairs, it was interesting to see how many people actually walked up the stairs. And I don't know if that was after they read your book or not. Activity's fantastic. It's actually the best thing that we can all do for our health. So 
what we found in our study, of course, you've all heard activity is good for you and every second day there's a new study, you only have to jog for 60 seconds, I heard now. <laughs> as long as you get a certain heart rate, 60 seconds, twice a day, that sounds good. Um, so a lot of the studies showed that intense activity that brings your heart rate up, that does these things, is the best sort of activity. So, of course, we went into our study and we're looking across 30 years and we're thinking, all oh, right, the intense exercises, they're going to do the best. Can't wait to see this hypothesis written. We're going to prove this right. It was wrong. It was the people who did exercise each and every day, 40 minutes to an hour. They did the best. They had the best everything. And so we were puzzled, like, hang on. This is not what the 12-week studies show. One-year follow-up, if you're lucky. So the thing is, when you're looking at chronic diseases of ageing, and, you know, just to say, and I, sorry, I sound like such a <laughs> chronic disease. When you talk about the chronic disease of ageing, the World Health Organisation, before COVID, <laughs> said chronic diseases of ageing are the next thing. And 80% of them, so around the world, around the globe, chronic diseases of ageing are killing everyone. That's our biggest problem in health until COVID appeared. Um, and 80% of them are preventable. So, um, sorry to use such a weird term, but they're preventable and they're killing us. And 80% of them are expected to be preventable by WHO. So it's really important that we look at these. But chronic diseases of ageing take 30 years to develop. So it was actually Australians. We published in the Lancet Neurology from our Australian study, 2015. It takes 30 years for you to get the amyloid levels in your brain associated with dementia. 30 years. Then there was an international study that agreed, it was in uh, people who've got a genetic form of Alzheimer's, and they looked at the same thing we looked at in these people with genetic Alzheimer's, 30, does it, 30 years. So if it takes 30 years to develop, you've got to be doing something for those 30 years. You can't just come in at the end. A lot of the drug trials in dementia, for anyone who is interested in dementia and is worried about it, it's terrifying to know it's both a terminal disease and there is no treatment available except symptomatic. So there's no disease modifying treatment, it's terrifying. A lot of the companies are saying, well, hang on, now we're looking at the data. We recruited people over 70, why? That's when dementia occurs. But now we're understanding more about dementia and five years ago these Australians published it takes 30 years. We actually think we probably should have gone in with the drug 20 years ago, and maybe then we could prevent dementia. Once you lose brain cells, this is one thing, you know, we can make hearts, you know, in the factory and just pop them in or borrow them from pigs, but what we cannot do is brain transplants, just cannot. And we haven't even worked out how to grow nerve cells back in the structured way necessary. The closest is in the spinal column, and let me just tell you, your spinal column is, you know, this, this, you know, it's very simple, all it has to do is react. Whereas the brain is incredibly complex. We're so far away from regrowing brain cells, so we have to stop them from dying. For your brain, at this point in medicine, prevention is the cure. And how would you prevent it then? Ah, oh, move every day. Move every day. <laughs> Movement is fantastic because it's not just that it is engaging all that we eat and metabolising it. So we, we eat more than we need to and we move less than we should. And our bodies evolved over thousands of years. How old are humans? Like we've found specimens thousands of years, probably longer. And we used to move so much. I mean, goodness, it was only 200 years ago we started carrying people around to show how important they were. And then we all wanted to be carried. And they bound feet in Asia to show how important the person was because they didn't have to walk. This uh, crazy idea that not moving is associated with affluence has only been a couple of hundred years. The human body, because we only have a couple of kids, it takes generations to evolve to a sedentary lifestyle and we're not evolving. We're dying of heart disease and stroke and dementia. Plus, when you move, it's actually anti-inflammatory. I know a lot of people with arthritis are like, oh, don't make me move. But, you know, it's weird. And you'll see now that a lot of the rheumatologists are recommending, you know, not vigorous, <laughs> horrible activity, <laughs> but actual movement can actually reduce inflammation. The blood flow around those joints actually removes a lot of those inflammatory metabolites that are causing the problem. So moving is, if you have to do just one thing, move. If you have to do two things, <laughs> move and eat well. And we all know what that is. <laughs> but there's so many diets and books it drives everyone mad so in my book what I did 
was we did a fascinating study, which I did for myself, how, how silly, but I did. Uh, all these diets, and I knew Mediterranean, DASH, and all these wonderful diets, but what are wines supposed to eat? Because I can't follow both diets at once, right? And so we did this study with a student who looked at the overlapping diets. It turns out, when you look at all those diets and put them on a radar chart, I'm being a weirdo again, aren't I? Radar <laughs> charts. When, when you overlap them and map them, 90% are eating the same stuff. Oh, I'm in the Mediterranean diet, I'm in the DASH diet. They're eating the same stuff 90% of the time. We mapped junk food diet, worst possible diet you can have, American diet, um, junk food diet, we mapped high fat diet, Mediterranean DASH diets, 90% of those people there going, ha, were eating the same stuff. Here's the pings. Junk food and high fat were eating processed food where the others were not. Not eating it, eating it. Don't eat processed food. Number two, the people on the good diet versus the junk food and the high fat were eating green leafy fruit, veg, ping, where the others just weren't. Eat green leafy <laughs> fruit and veg. But you get that in your McDonald's book. No, you don't. <laughs> Look at those lettuces. I eat McDonald's because I've got kids. It's never green. It's maybe yellow with a bit of tinge of green. No, no, no. Um, and that's processed foods. Um, fat. Avoid fried. Anything fried, avoid. So don't worry about your butter and all, you know, just avoid fried foods, avoid processed foods. Eat green leafy veg, nuts, fish. Make sure you're vegetarian a couple of days a week, fish a couple of days a week, and you're right. Don't worry about diets. I, I would really love any of you guys to email me or post it. People post now. I'm not on Instagram, but an actual recipe from the chart I put in the book. I'm such a scientist. I put down a chart. Here you go, select five of these ingredients, make yourself a meal, eat that, you'll be perfect. Well, you know what I do? I literally put it in a blender, drink. Because scientifically, that's a good meal. But I would love if you guys are cooks out there, you can make something, that'd be great. Because people are like, give me a recipe, I'm like, blender, ingredients, drink. Fantastic. We're running out of time here, and I think it's probably time for somebody else to ask you some questions, even though I've still got a stack. Um, does anybody else want to ask Cassandra a question, or shall I carry on? Uh, hang on, hang on a minute. I've got two things to say. <laughs> one is Cassandra does not give medical advice in open forums. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. No, it uh, wasn't about medical advice. And the, um, and the second thing is, you need a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, of course. Sorry. Um, it, when you mentioned the British study about the jugular narrowing um, and then with the oestrogen supplementation that uh, that didn't happen, I recently read that oestrogen is linked to um, movement and I wonder if the um, narrowing of the jugular can be avoided by, you know, cardio of a certain pace or anything or... Yeah, that's um, I'm not really sure if I've understood what you said correctly. No, 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 that's really interesting. So in the study they did adjust... They did adjust for a variety of things, including what's called a PROCAM score. It's a cardiovascular risk score. And they did adjust, but I don't believe they adjusted for physical activity. That is fascinating because we all know oestrogen improves mood. So that was some of the early work. People who had their oestrogen maintained or were put on oestrogen, their mood improved, libido improves. So actually that improvement could make people more active. And I'm going to go check that study Where's my phone? <laughs> <laughs> because I don't know they just have a physical activity. They did for cardiovascular risk, but not all the scores have physical activity as part of it. So, yeah, because oestrogen does so many other beneficial things. And you know how it's good for bone health? You know, it was only a five-year study and they were youngish women, but if you've got stronger bones, you might be more active too, which would be great for your heart. Oh, uh, no, need a microphone. Just, I can hear you perfectly, actually. But it's just, it's just everybody else in the room. Genetics. What part does genetics play? Now, I say this. My nana was 96 when she died. Auntie Al and Auntie Ellie May were 97 and 93. My mum was the exception. She only made 80. Now, what part does genetics play in ageing? And, and, yeah. I mean, I must say they aged well. So, genetics plays a, a big part. So, uh, for dementia... 
there's a gene called the APOE4 gene. And if you hold the APOE4 gene, and a quarter of the population does, you have four times the risk of getting dementia. That's why often a doctor will say, what's your family? <laughs> because if your family has disease, it's more likely you will have disease. It's not because they're your family and they gave it to you. It's because the genes are passed down and there's a percentage chance you got that bad gene. Having said that, because genes are important, I'm a geneticist, so I'm always like, genes. But environment in our world is actually more important. So we just published a paper, it's not in the book, it just got published a couple of months ago. We looked at women with this amyloid in their brain who had APOE4, and the APOE4 women are much more likely to have amyloid in their brain. So it's clearly doing something to disturb the whole system. The women who had APOE4 gene who did more activity could bring their amyloid in their brain down to the levels of the women without the gene. So your environment can actually reverse your genetics in some diseases, which includes heart and bone. Gee, I'm glad I've gone back to work. Well, the thing <laughs> is about your, you know, 90-year-old grandparents, you know, I bet you they walk to work, rode to work. Yep. Yeah. So, you know, their environment was just so different to ours. Oh, so they were eating organic vegetables. So she was just saying they're eating organic vegetables from their own garden. They oh, yeah, weren't paying for organic right. vegetables. No, they paid for <laughs> Had cho fresh eggs, not those battery hens eating God knows what. Somebody at the back over there. I've actually got two questions. The first one is, like, I'm just talking about my personal experience just last week. I like mangoes. My kids want ice cream. So we went to Coles, not advertising for Coles. Mango is $4 and Maximum ice cream is $4 for four ice cream. Do you know where I'm coming from? What can be done to actually encourage healthy eating? If you mean just giving you a very simple example, you know, one piece of fruit, four ice cream, you know, on an average working class family, this is which way people are going to go. They are going to go towards the cheaper option. That's absolutely correct. Yeah. So this is getting to... I guess environment in that it's the structure of our society. Mm. So for example, can I use your grandma, because she's fantastic, if I may. Mm -hmm. Her grandma would have eaten apricots with pits in them, worms half the time. When I was a kid, I had so many little weird weevils and stuff when I opened my, my peaches, you know, but we didn't pay that much for fruit. Yeah. Now you want people to have this perfect yeah. fruit that's all year round, and of course it's gonna cost more. Yeah. And we've kind of, so we've changed our whole culture and society and structure when my grandma was alive, we never bought fruit because she had an apricot tree, nectarine tree, you know. Yeah. And so we were always kind of eating organic, weevil-filled fruit. <laughs> um, and we don't do that anymore. Mm. So it is about a cultural society. And I, I, don't, I can't kill the world today, but we can. We can. Mm. There's something about the way we have shifted the way we live our lives. Yeah. My second question is... Um healthy aging, is there any difference with people retiring? Does it make a difference to what's their health? Because I've, just my personal experience, almost everyone that are retired, except the active ones, <laughs> are all having some kind of medical problems or, you know, putting on weight, having, car you know, just slowly yeah. having medical conditions. Um, if, if people work longer, maybe just shorter hours, do you think it'll make a difference? So I actually know the answer to this. As a researcher, the answer is yes. We all know what she's saying is right. We all know it. But they've researched it, they've proved it right, and in Japan, they are actually instituting what they call, it's in their language, so I'm gonna translate it badly, but it's a um, elderly employment. So you don't work nine to five, five days a week, and you don't do the same job, potentially, even that you were doing, but there are jobs specific for the older population, they're sending them back to work and they've proved that it works. So in the book, it's kind of cut up by chapters. So if you look at all the chapters, all the chapters are improved in work, except in our country. So in Japan, they actually do exercise at work. They actually do exercise. And also they have different... Um, we have snack machines. <laughs> like, and the hospital's better now, but my God, my entire time growing up in the hospital was just snack machines. That's all you had to eat. Um, whereas in Japan, they have different, different food available. So it's different in their country. But um, in their country, they're ticking those two boxes, movement and nutrition at work, as well as purpose, socialisation, 
So if you look at just the 10 chapters in the book, it ticks every one of them. To be engaged, does it have to be work? Does it have to be... So we did a study looking at volunteer work because women, they don't do traditional employment. So it, it's not so easy because they're... It's like we work and don't get paid even when we're working. And um, we also do a lot of work that's unpaid. And so people are like, oh, they're not working. Hang on. So we actually looked at this and people who were doing volunteer work as they were getting older, much healthier. But that's not to do with money. That's not... To, it's to do with movement, socialisation, purpose. Over here, Geraldine. Any more? Okay. Could you give us some information with regard to assessment of dementia? So what's your specific question? How do you assess it? Yes, yes. Okay. Well, from your view. Yep, yep. So um, this is kind of an excellent question. The first thing I'll say is um, that in any cohort you ask, half the people will say they have a memory problem. And when they looked at this, um, they actually published papers called The Worried World because when they looked, these people didn't get dementia and didn't have dementia. So it's a very bad question because all of us are like, oh, actually... And what's funny and interesting is when they look at someone near you, close and dear, says they've got a problem with their memory, that's where <laughs> they have a problem with their memory. And they published this. And they found that when the individual was worried about their memory, they were actually less likely to get dementia because one of the first things that goes when you actually get dementia is what we call insight. So you're unaware that you have a problem. Whereas if you're hypervigilant, you're probably spot on. However, I will say that dementia is something that we've only studied in older people. Ours is a rare study around the world that did cognitive tests in young people. So in Australia, no other study did it. There's now studies that have started doing it, but those people aren't going to be 70 for 30 years from now. So in Australia, we're the only ones that have 70-year-old cognition in the same people we did cognition in 50. It was rare. Why would anyone measure... They, they asked me this when I got the grant. Why, would it, why are you measuring cognition in healthy young women? Anyway, um, but I actually think there's cognitive decline that we aren't detecting in the community. And yet, really, that's where I started this journey, was with people taking medications, going, I'm telling you, it's affecting me. No test would show it's affecting them, but I trusted them. It was affecting them. And so we've actually got a new study called Age Happy. We just launched it last year. All join. Please all join. Age Happy. Um, and we've got online cognitive tests. These tests are hard. So a lot of our neuropsychological tests, they're annoying, but they're actually designed to see which part of the brain you've lost cells in. So young, healthy people or healthy people get very good scores on these tests. Whereas the computerised tests are designed to actually do speed of processing, lots of things that will pick up abnormalities. And that's an area I'm really interested in because we don't yet know whether that will lead to dementia. Is that an early sign? And that's something we've really got to explore because, frankly, now, without knowing 27 passwords, I can't even live a day. <laughs> so I can't afford to lose any of my memory. <laughs> Couldn't function. And, you know, in assessments in Australia, we, we have what's... Ca in Victoria, we have CADAMS clinics. They're fantastic. So they're memory assessment clinics. Anyone with a memory issue, GPs can refer there. The thing is the wait time. So I understand a diagnosis of dementia in this country takes up to two years. That's crazy. So we've got to get better at it. Lady here. So I just want to ask, you, you talked about the move and the things that have stopped us moving and we've got to keep moving. Um, but that, just that, building on that question there about using the brain and, and things like that, there's so many things now that... Uh, you know, I don't even have to add, off, add up my score on the golf cart now because it, <laughs> there's an app that does it all. There's so many things that that mental things that we used to think about. Um, so how, how is that impacting us in terms of our ageing? Because we're not getting that same function all the time that we, we yeah, need to Yeah, that's a very good point. I drive down to Geelong today. I, I come to Geelong. I used to come often. And uh, this time I arrived, I was like, oh, my God, we're here, because Google just said, you have arrived. You know, in the old days, you were like, where's the turn-off? Where am I going? You just don't use it anymore, because Google just tells you when you get there. I agree. So, look, one thing I will say 
is that they did all these studies on um, cognitive training. So they said, oh, do crosswords, do this, do that. You know, when you test people, <laughs> they are much better at crosswords. <laughs> Got dementia, but really good at crosswords. <laughs> so one of the things about this cognitive stuff is human body, right? We know this. The more you do something, the better you get at it. You do crosswords, you'll be better at crosswords. But that doesn't necessarily prevent you from getting dementia. But education is the biggest protector from dementia, thank God. <laughs> got lots of that but it doesn't really protect you educated people are really good at faking it because we're trained to have lists and charters and cards and so we actually it's it might not be that we're not getting dementia it's that we have all these coping mechanisms to support our cognition mm. but nevertheless that's fine, because the definition of dementia, you have mild cognitive impairment, it means your cognitive scores are not so good, you're forgetting things, right? That's mild cognitive impairment. When do you become dementia? There's only one definition, functional impairment. So it doesn't matter. Using cards, using supports, mm -hmm. you will never, by the definition of the medical classification, have dementia until you have dipped your function. Oh, sorry, we're just going to make you say it again so everyone can hear. <laughs> you spoke of cognition. What's the research into street drugs, prescription drugs, alcohol, and very low mood on cognition? Okay. So the before I give you the answer, there is not enough research in this space because people who take drugs often don't say how much they take and don't, go into research studies and don't end up in them long term. And remember I said cognition decline takes three to four decades to occur. So we don't know enough. But what we do know is that drugs affect the brain and they affect the brain badly. What we do know is that you can actually get Parkinson's disease from some of the MDPD drugs. <laughs> and Parkinson's disease, if you have it for long enough, gives you Parkinson's dementia. What we know is alcohol's got its own special kind of dementia. <laughs> called Wernicke's encephalopathy. So, you know, like there are specialised dementia. For, don't, don't put toxins in. That's in the book. Um, you know, the brain's a very sensitive organ. I, I suggest you don't muck with it. Um, even marijuana, Delta THC, like it, it directly affects the brain. And there's a lot of debates. So people who have marijuana are more likely to get schizophrenia. But there are some people who say, well, hang on, how do you know they weren't self-medicating? Well, they were never diagnosed. They didn't appear to be acting differently. However, there's an argument that some people say maybe they had subtle symptoms they could pick up that made them reach for the marijuana and that's why they got schizophrenia later. And, you know, we won't know without the longitudinal perspective research that we've done here that's so rare. We're the longest running study in Australia. Where's the men's study? They didn't come back. It started the same year we started. But the women stuck with us, God bless them. Oh, uh, yes, yeah, so um, she, I'll just repeat the question. She asked, what about depressed mood? Which she's asked twice, I just forgot. <laughs> Uh-oh. Okay. Um, so mood and the brain. I actually wanted to do psychiatry. When I was doing my neurology, you could actually do a joint psychiatry neurology, wow. and I actually did my PhD. I hosted myself in the Department of Psychiatry, and I, they actually let me hang out there and I was going to do this double... D and then I didn't because I had a kid. But anyway, um, I love psychiatry. The brain is one organ. Don't tell me that neurology is different from psychiatry. It's one organ. The neurotransmitters are flying around there together. It's the one thing. The overlap between mental health and cognitive health is complete. Now, I told you before when I started, the brain controls everything. So the overlap between mental health and physical health is complete because the brain controls everything. There's actually something called pseudo-dementia. Now, dementia is a terminal disease, right? So it killed you. It's progressive, no treatment, never gets better. Pseudo-dementia, 100% reversible. You can reverse pseudo-dementia. What's pseudo-dementia? It's mental health. It's depression so severe, people call it pseudo-dementia because it looks 
exactly like dementia. That's how much your mental health can affect your cognition. It can make you appear 100% like you have dementia. Not MCI, <laughs> dementia. MCI being mild cognitive impairment, yeah, sorry. I think we have to stop there, Cassandra. We oh. could sit here all night. This has been absolutely fascinating. So thank you I'll very much. I'll come back. I'll come back. <laughs> my uh, honour to thank both of you, um, Geraldine and Cassandra. We started by saying, you know, how amazing the, uh, a woman's brain is. I'm feeling like mine is about the size of a pea, actually. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you so much for sharing your brain with us tonight. It's been an um, absolute privilege. And our thanks also to um, Lynn, who's from Talkie Books, who's at the back. Um, who's there with some copies of, of your book that I'm sure everyone will be snapping up. So um, thank you to both of you. Please join me just finally for one last round of, of thanks. Thank